Okay, welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 53, which reads as follows. Yatha pi pupara simha kaira mala guni bahu evang jatena matjena katabang kusalang bahum which means just as yatapi puparasimha, just as from a heap of flowers one could make kaira, one could make uh, a great many uh, bouquets, mala gune bahum could make bahu could make many bouquets of flowers. Ewang jate namache na katabangu salang rang bahum. Even so, jate namache na by one who is born a uh, mortal, by one who is born mortal, born a human being. Katabangu salang bahum. Much wholesomeness should be should be done. So just as uh, just as you can make many f many bouquets of flowers, of beautiful arrangements from a, when you have a whole heap of flowers, even so someone who's born as a human being with the potential to do so much good, they should make use of it and out of the out of what they're given, do much uh, wholesomeness. That's the meaning. So, and this is the story of a very famous Buddhist and uh, therefore it's very long and involved and therefore I have four cue cards to follow just so I don't forget anything. I don't know if I'll actually need them, I've never done this before. Um, but I didn't want to forget anything or mix things up. Uh, so this, this famous lay Buddhist is the disciple Visakha, who was um, the chief female lay disciple of our Gautama Buddha. She was born in the city of Badia in the Anga kingdom, which is a, uh, a sub-kingdom, or I don't know, we need to call it a fiefdom or whatever, some kind of sub-kingdom of Magadha, which was... Uh, ruled by King Bimbisara, who was a Buddhist. And so he had a, a, a very large kingdom surrounded by smaller kingdoms under his rule. And in one of them there lived uh, this rich man called Dan named Dananjaya. And so King Bimbisara had many very, very rich merchants or treasurers, or let's say rich business people in his uh, kingdom. And one of them was, was Dananjaya, who had a daughter named Visaka. Now, when, um, when Visaka was seven years old, she became a Sotapanna. This is also a famous story that the Buddha came to Anga to teach um, Soraya, I think, or to, to, to no, Sona, Sona Danda, I can't remember, to teach someone. He had this idea to teach someone in Anga, and while he was there, uh, uh, Visaka went to see the Buddha with her, with all of her, dis with all of her retinue, and became a Sotapanna at seven years old. That's what the story says. And so the, the, uh, there was there was a connection with Buddhism from a very early age. And this continues on. Eventually, she becomes the chief lay disciple. So how it went, I don't know if I'm not even going to use these. She, um, well, what happened was we have here we have Magadha, which is run by Bimbisara, and then we have uh, Kosala, which is run by Pasenadi, the king. And Bimbisara, they were both Buddhists, but Pasenadi was a little bit of a shady, sort of uh, sketchy sort of Buddhist. He didn't really keep morality, and he didn't really seem to be a very wise or enlightened being. He certainly didn't become a Sotapanna or anything of the sort when, when he was alive. Uh, Bimbisara, on the other hand, became a Sotapanna when he first met the Buddha, and as a result, was was very very fixed and, and very well established in the Buddha's teaching. 
Um, and, and so Basenadi would always make these make make trouble with with the other kings around. He wasn't he, he wasn't really the brightest uh, the brightest what do you call it, brightest bulb in the room. Uh, and so he, he one of the things he did is uh, if we remember he he asked the Buddha's the Buddha's uh, family for a bride. He wanted uh, one of the Buddha's relatives as his queen and caused a huge stir because they didn't want to give him one and but they were afraid and so they ended up uh, spelling their own doom by tricking him and so on. So we, we've already heard that story. But another story is how he got Visaka, how Visaka ended up in Kosala. Um, Basenadi thought, hey, there's lots of rich people in Bimbisara's kingdom, but there's no rich people in my kingdom. Uh, so what if I ask him to, to, for one of his rich, rich business people to come and set up their business, their, their home in, uh, in my kingdom? And so he went to Bimbisara and he asked him, and Bimbisara said, hmm, I can't really, you, know, you, can't just, you can't just ask one of these guys to pick up and, and go. Uh, but one of them had a son, right? Dananji is actually the son of one of these five rich people. And so he says, well, well, the son of one of them, he's really rich, and I could send him. If he'll go, I'll send him to you. So he went and asked Dananji, and I picked up his whole family and moved to, to Kosala. Uh, and set up the city of Saketa. Saketa is... Uh, they, they, they just established this city somewhere in the countryside based on their, their whole retinue. And... I'm going to go by my notes. Yeah. And then while, she was, while they were there, there was this... Um, one of Pasenadi's... One, one of the business people in Pasenadi's kingdom, he had a son who was looking for a wife. No, he had a son who, who was unmarried, and so they wanted, to get a, they wanted to get a wife for him. And so they went around wife hunting. And how you do wife hunting is you get these, apparently you get, these, you get the Brahmins, these priests, to go around and look for a, a woman who has uh, the right characteristics and the right birth, because it's very complicated actually. You have to get someone who's the right station, and you have to talk to the parents, and it's, it's nothing like marriage nowadays, right? It's just give him a ring and that's it. No, there's, there was, it was quite an involved process back then. And so a lot of the, the story is about these kind of things. There's lots of things in this story that are not really of interest to us as meditators, but uh, it, we, we have to, this is an important part of the story because uh, it, it, it sets the stage for the problem that Visaka had because this son, uh, this family wasn't Buddhist. Now they had no interest in Buddhism, and, and from the time that the Buddha moved, see, the Buddha would spend most of his time, surprisingly, not in Magadha, but actually in in uh, Kosala, in near Savati, which is in actually in the north, north of uh, northwest, the north of uh, Uttar Pradesh, north of Varanasi, Varanasi, quite a bit. Uh, but it was in uh, the Kosala kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. And but the whole time he was there, there this Brahmin, there this Brahmin, I guess, this family never never went to see the Buddha. And they lived right near the Buddha, in Savati, uh, and ne never thought once to go to see the Buddha. But they spent all their time paying respect to these naked ascetics. So. This, this isn't something that they thought of at the time. This isn't something that Visaka's father thought of. Um, but okay, so what happened is they sent these Brahmins out. The this, this sons, this son actually refused. He said, there's no way I'm not going to marry anyone. I'm, I'm not interested in having a wife. There's just lots of trouble. And, and uh, you know, they just whine and complain all the time. And <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of biased on that. On that, uh, in that. I'm kind of with this guy, you know. Wives, they're almost as bad as husbands, I think. Not that I've ever had either. Um, but they, they, they pushed him and pushed him and pushed him and finally said, fine, if you find a woman who has five types of beauty, there's these five beauties, and it's like the beauty of hair, the beauty of teeth, the beauty of skin, I don't remember, the beauty of this, beauty of that, it's, it's not really a monk sort of topic, so I didn't write that down. Uh, if you say, if you can find someone who is perfect, of perfect beauty, this guy's 
terribly superficial, right? So here, I, here you think he, maybe he's holding out because he just doesn't want to deal with the person, the other person's mental problems, right? But here he's he's actually so superficial. He's thinking, oh, I'll only take her if she's super beautiful, which is really dangerous, you see, because some some people are just very very physically attractive, but uh, of no mental capacity whatsoever. I'd be much more concerned of her having some mental prowess. I don't know if that was one of the five beauties, the beauty of mind. I can't remember. I don't think so. Well, maybe it was, and then we'll exempt him from this. Uh, but anyway, they, they, so they went all throughout the land, and of course they didn't find someone of perfect beauty until they found uh, Wisaka. And, and how it happened, another interesting part of the story is uh, there was a festival, and everyone, all the women... Normally the women would have to stay at home and they couldn't come out or something, I don't know. They, or they had to cover themselves up with a, with a sari when they go out or something. But uh, there's a festival and then they're allowed to, to, to go out and, and show themselves. And I believe in that time they wouldn't even, you know, they wouldn't even have to wear to cover up their chest. It was, you know, they, were, they, they could be in, fairly exposed. Um, and that has something, we'll, we'll see how that plays into, plays into this in the, few, in the rest of the story actually. Uh, but so the Visaka and her, her, her retinue of women went, uh, that were going down to bathe by the river. And then suddenly it started to rain. And while it was raining, there was this, uh, or while they were going, there was this, this festival going on and they were looking for suitable brides for this guy. And they were looking and they couldn't find anyone. And then it started raining and Visaka, all of her, all of her, her women retinue ran into the, this hall where they were having this uh, sort of this beauty pageant or whatever, and uh, and they escaped from the rain, but Wisaka just walked. She didn't, she let all of her, her attendants run, and, but she walked quite, quite slowly and casually into the hall. And the Brahmins looked at her as she came in, and she was all drenched, and they looked at her, but they saw, oh, she has, she exhibits four of the beauties. Yeah, so it wasn't beauty of mind, because they saw she had four of these types of beauties, but they couldn't see the beauty of teeth if she had beautiful teeth or not. Isn't that ridiculous? So let's choose a wife based on what her teeth are like. But really, that's how people think, no? Uh, and so, although there is something to that, you see, there is something to beauty, potentially. Because if a person has, or they say, they say it's karmic. If you've, uh, if you've had bad speech in the past, it, it affects your teeth or something like that. Like, there could be something there. But anyway, it's all in the past. It's nothing to do with who we are now. People, some people are very did bad things, and so they have the, the idea is that they have some karmic result in this life. But you don't see it. it does, you don't see the the the, the habit. Uh, they, they can be actually quite nice people, and it's often because of the effects of their bad karma that they were born with these things. So they feel really, really humble, and uh, they they understand this. Whereas people who are born with all these worldly good qualities and, and money and power and so on. They don't have any idea, they forget how they got there. They don't have any sort of shame or fear and so on. So it's, uh, it's certainly not a, a way of picking good people. No, so there's nothing there. Um, right, so they, so they asked, they, 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 they just said something as she went by, trying to sort of engage her in, in conversation. They said, hmm, Look at this woman, she's uh, pretty lazy, huh? Something like that. And she said, excuse me? And they said, well, we see your, your, uh, your attendants running in, but there you are letting yourself get wet. You obviously, you, 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 as beautiful as you might be, you, 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 don't, you seem to be a bit of a weakling or a la lazy uh, person, uh, not, not even able to keep up with your attendants. And she said, oh no, that's, that's not why I didn't run. She said, um, there are two reasons why I didn't run. The first reason is that, well, there are four, four, four she, and she, she gave this interesting teaching that there are four, four types of people who should never run, or four beings that should never run. The first one is a king, because when a king runs, people say, look at that silly king running like a, an ordinary person, right? You would never see a king running. Number two, the king's elephant. When the king's elephant is carrying the king, you should never. See, it should always be proud and regal, just like the king. The third one is a monk, 
um, an ascetic. An ascetic should never run because they look silly. And uh, the fourth is a, is a lady. And we say a lady should never run. I mean, this was, you have to understand this was this is a very heavily cultural setting. So a lot of the story. This is a story about a woman in India, and so we have to ignore these sorts of sort of uh, sexually or gender gender discrimination sort of things because it was very very much discriminatory towards women. They really had a hard time, and I think to some extent still do in these cultures. So you have to apologize for that. This isn't the teaching I'm trying to give that yes, women should should not run, but in India there was kind of that thing. And I think for the other three it does hold. Um, I'm not sure about a woman. Uh, no, I think that that's no more so than a man anyway. There's no reason except culturally. But that's really what this is. It's all cultural. A king is cultural. A monk, in a sense, is a cultural uh, artif artifact. Buddhist culture. There's no reason, there's nothing wrong with running. But monks have to sort of hold up a... Um, an ideal, and so they have to be a kind of a representative, and so they do have some kind of um, responsibility to maintain decorum, like a king or like a uh, like a lady. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the, the whole running thing is kind of interesting because I remember when I was going to university as a monk, and I remember thinking that we can't run, and then I'd see the bus. I'd have to catch the bus every morning from the monastery in Stony Creek all the way to Western Hamilton the Beeline bus, about an hour trip. And uh, you know, it only come like once an hour, so you have to catch the right bus or else you're transferring. And, and uh, you know, so I'd get out of class like 10 minutes before the bus was going to go and I'd be like walking, walking, walking. And then I'd see the bus and I'd walking, 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 walking. And I remember, I remember missing the bus, seeing the bus stop and walking, walking, walking. And then the bus goes and still walking. So I remember walking very quickly sometimes. But meditators certainly should be careful about these sorts of things. This is why monk, monks are supposed to be the, the representative or the exemplary meditator. So for meditators, this is a good example for us to, to think of. Um, we have, uh, it's, not, it's inappropriate for us to engage in quick and, and uh, um, spontaneous movements and actions and speeches. We should try to be thoughtful. And as the Buddha said, Durahula, try to contemplate before we do something, whether it's necessary and whether it's useful, and be mindful when we're doing things. And af even after we've performed actions, we should be mindful and recollect, reflect on whether that was useful and whether we should do it again. Okay, so anyway, so they, through this conversation, they established two things. Oh, and the, sorry, the other reason for not running is she said, I belong to my... This is an interesting thing for children. She said, I belong to my parents. And my parents expect to, me to um, be, be of some value in the future. She said somehow I'm a, she said I'm like a uh, possession of my parents or belonging. I belong to them, and uh, so she wanted to. Basically, she wanted to make it's uh, archaic sort of way. I wanted to make my parents proud, and I wanted to serve my parents and be of some use. And if I get hurt, if I were to fall down and get hurt, then I would only be a burden to my parents which is a very sort of humble way of thinking. Not like if I broke my leg, that would, that would hurt for me and I'd, I'd feel bad. It was like I'd be a burden to other people if I hurt myself, which was uh, her second reason. So they established two things from this. One, that she was quite a wise individual or a thoughtful individual. And two, they saw her teeth <laughs> while she talked. That's what it says. So they said, well, here's the, here's the woman for us. She said, they said, we come from this... Uh, Purna Vaddana was his name, the son of Migara. Migara, Migara is this rich man or uh, businessman, and Purna Vaddana was his son. And so she asked about them, and she said, oh, "Okay, well, that sounds like a suitable husband. Go talk to my father." And so they went and talked to the father, and yada yada yada. They they all they got married, and uh, didn't even think about the fact that this guy wasn't Buddhist, which is really really a curious sort of thing, considering how Visakha was a Sotapanna, I guess. There's not much you can do in a cultural situation, and probably what the text doesn't say is that there's not much you can do when your parents want you to get married and, and the, child, the woman wouldn't have much say in it, which is sad, of course. But that's, that was the way of it. And uh, so they sent, her, they sent her to live in Savati. Savati was where, this, where Migara lived, which is actually, it's a... 
It may have been one of the reasons why she accepted, thinking, oh, I'll be very close to the Buddha, because, of course, the Buddha spent most of his time in Savati. And so they sent her along with, um, with cartfuls, it says cartfuls of gold, five carts of gold, five cartfuls of silver, five cartfuls of f food and rice and this and that, and a herd of cattle and servants. The servants was an interesting part because they asked um, her father, Dananjaya, what about servants for her? What about um, you know, people, to, attendants, people to take care of her? And he said, well, I don't want to force people to go. I only want to send the people that, that love and respect Visaka. So he said, if I tell people, you go, you go, you go, then I'm afraid I'll be sending people that don't want to be with her. And uh, so they, uh, so, so, so he, didn't, he didn't ask for anyone to go with her. And on the morning that she was set to go, uh, the morning that, that she was set to go, all of the villagers heard, heard uh, that she was going. Fourteen villages, this, this city had fourteen villages, and, and every family said, uh, Visak is going, what, the, what are we doing staying here? And so they all like got up and deserted their villages. But... Uh, as they were walking down the road, taking her back to Savati, they saw, what are these people doing here? Those are, my, those are the people who want to come and wait on me. And they, and they said, we don't need those people. How are we going to feed them? And Misaka said, it's okay, I'll, we'll feed them, we'll feed them with, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take care of them. And he said, we don't have need for them. And so they actually beat them back. They actually took sticks and rocks and, and had, to beat them, had to beat them back because they, they wouldn't say no, they were, going, they were bound to go. And it says, only the people who refused to turn back even when beaten did they bring with them. That's what this story says. I'm not making this up. Right, and uh, as well, uh, one other thing that they brought with them was this, um, this headdress. It's called a uh, uh, pasadana, I think it's called, some kind of... Uh, some kind of a, a crown or something, but it would have been a headdress, that, some kind of jewelry that you put on your head. And this one was so elaborate that it actually reached all the way down to her feet. And it was made entirely out of silver thread with jewels studded in it. And just like, it was worth nine koti and 100,000, nine koti plus one lakh of gold, whatever that means. I mean, it's just gold measurement of gold coins. One, nine koti. One koti is either a million or ten million, I think ten million. So lots and lots of money, just the most expensive piece of jewelry that ever existed. And one of the things you have to understand, a lot of this is, is outrageous, but to some extent Wisaka was, a, was a, a very special person who deserved these sort of outrageous things, very extreme. We're talking about the, mo the, you know, the richest, most well-endowed uh, person in, in India, or one of them. She was just so loaded with goodness and the results of goodness, that uh, many extreme things seem to have happened in her life. She was, she was extremely lucky uh, in her life and well, well endowed with uh, material uh, possessions. And another final thing is before she left, her, her father, Dananjaya, gave her ten ten uh, admonitions or ten pieces of advice, ten exhortations, ten teachings. And while he was giving them, Migara, the, the father of her husband-to-be, was listening. He was, he was eavesdropping. He, he overheard them. And there was uh, uh, Wisaka and her father talking. And her father said to her, now when you go to live with your, in your husband's house, you have to remember you know, living with your in your husband's house, it's it, you know this in India it was a big deal. The husband would be like the owner of the wife, and 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 uh, it, it wasn't. They didn't have it very well, the women. So he gave her these admonitions. He said, number one, the fire, the in the inside, the indoor fire should never go outside. Number two, the outdoor fire should never come in. Fire outside should never be brought in. You should give only to one who gives. Don't give to one who does not give. And give to one who both gives, to either, who either gives or doesn't give. You should uh, sit happily, 
eat happily and sleep happily, tend the fire and honor the angels. Strange, no? Strange sort of advice to give. So Migara kind of thought that was strange, but he didn't say anything. And Visaka said, thank you, Father, and kissed and hugged goodbye or whatever, and then left on her way to Savati. Well, she, uh, sorry, one last, one final thing. See, I'm, I have to write this down, I'm going to forget. The last thing to, the last aspect of it was he sent eight families. He, he gathered together eight uh, of his his um, advisors, and he said, go with her, settle down in Savati, and if if anything if anything happens, you're to look after her, you're to to take a stand for her, and to to because these were families of note, families who who, of res, who were respected families, and he said these eight families should be her support in Savati, to someone that she would be able to, they would be her advisors and people to sort of look after her. Right, so there we have. Then. So Visaka moved to live with her new family. All was going well. Um, one thing that happened during the, her time there, the first thing that we have, to, we have to note, is that in the middle of the night, one of her horses gave birth. And she heard about it, and she heard that there was, there was, um, there was, there was some danger for the foal, the foal, no? And uh, so she went down in the middle of the night, she went down herself into the stable and cared for the new baby and oiled up its body or something and made sure it was warm and kept it and, and tended to it throughout the night. So this was one thing that will, will play a part in the future of the story. Okay, now the crux, the, the, uh, crux of the story, or the, what do you call it, the, the peak of the story, was in regards to these naked ascetics. Now Migara, as I said, the father of her, her husband, doesn't talk about the husband actually from this point on, which is somewhat interesting, but uh, her, her father-in-law was a staunch supporter of the naked ascetics. And so on her marriage, he didn't even think of inviting the Buddha or, or, or getting, bringing the Buddha around, but he got all the naked ascetics to come to her wedding and then he called Visakha and said, come and pay respect to the Arhants. And she's like, oh, the Arahant's great, and she's so excited. And so he, he goes out, and she comes out, and, she's, and she sees a bunch of naked guys sitting there, and she's like, these aren't Arahants, these are, these are a bunch of naked fools. And she, so she goes back inside, and the naked ascetics see this, and, and hear her say this, and they get all upset, and they say, how could you, how could you bring a, a, a heretic Buddhist follower of Gotama here, she'll be the ruin of you, and, da, 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 da. and he said, oh, come now. He tried to placate them, and, and he sent them on their way, and kind of kept that under wraps, but then Visaka was, she's, uh, what's the thing about, about Sotapanas on up, is they, they, they can never hide, and they, they're never afraid of their, their beliefs, or, or, or their, their religion, I guess. Um, their adherence to Buddhism. They would never say something like, all right, all right, I, uh, I'll, you know, they would never make fun of the Buddha or they would never renounce it. Or There's a story that goes, this one poor man, very poor man became a, a Sotapanna and then he was asked by, I think it was Saka or one of the angels came to test him and said, look, I'll give you a million gold. All you have to say is, I don't take the Buddha as my refuge. I don't take the Dhamma as my refuge. I don't take the Sangha as my refuge. And he said, "What are you talking about? I'm not." He said, uh, "What do I need from your money? I'm, 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 I'm one of the richest people on earth. I've got the, I've got Buddhism as my, as my riches." And uh, wasn't wasn't at all interested in taking money. So this is so, there's sort of this tendency among in among even sotapanas that they don't that, well, it's not even a tendency. It's a fixedness of it that you. You, you can remark about them is that they're not afraid. Uh, they're not. They they have no doubt or uncertainty, and they never in for any reason, even if someone was going to kill them, even at pain, at uh, over fear of death, would they renounce or denigrate or put aside their faith in Buddhism? So, 
it had to come out eventually. Eventually it had to come to a head. You know what I'm saying? It was very difficult for them to keep, keep it under wraps because they're just not afraid. They know what's right. And so she knew what's, what was right. And so it came to a head when Migara was sitting there, the father-in-law was sitting there eating food, eating his, his ma massive amount of, of exquisite uh, what do you call it? good food. Um, and a Buddhist monk walked by on alms and came to the front door and Visaka was at the, went to the front door and, and opened the door and saw him there and stepped out of the way to let her father-in-law see the, the monk and her father-in-law just pretends he doesn't see him, he keeps eating. <coughs> she, she clears her throat and pretends he doesn't see and she sighs and she says, Please, Venerable Sir, move on. My father is eating stale fare. Stale fare. Stale fare is the English translation. Old food is, the, I think, Purana. Old, old fare. Uh, old, old food. <laughs> He's eating old food. This was her excuse for why he wasn't giving her anything. Now, Migara heard this, and he wasn't exactly thrilled about it and not being Buddhist he wasn't one of those people who could control their temper and he certainly didn't sit there and acknowledge angry angry no he let it get the better of him and all of his anger at her over her chastising about the the naked ascetics at her marriage and and all the time picking and not wanting to pay respect to the arahants <laughs> He blew up at her and said, out, out, get out of my house, you wretched heretic, I won't, I won't have this, leave now, go back to Saketa, back to your home. And uh, Visaka wasn't afraid. She said, uh, excuse me, I'm not some hand, some servant that you can just dismiss like that, I belong to, do you, do you know who my father is, kind of thing. Uh, she said, uh, it's, it's totally, it's, this is not how it goes. You can't just kick someone out of your house. See, there, are, there are rules and there's decorum. She said, my father, when he sent me here, he, he, he sent along eight families to be my uh, support, bring them here and let them judge the case. And so he said, very well, call them over and I'll tell them what, what happened. And she's like, this is... Totally, and you, know, you don't insult your father-in-law that way. And so they, they came over and he said, she says I'm, he told her, he said, what, what happened? And he said, she says that this woman, this woman says that I'm eating unclean food, which he told this man, and this, this monk, uh, that I was eating unclean food. And she said, that's not what I said. She said, I, told, I said that he, you were eating stale fare. Purana. Purana means old. And the point is, here is this opportunity to do a good deed. You see a monk, you see someone who needs food at your door, and you have the opportunity to do something good with your life, and you just keep, you, you, you're content with um, you know, consuming the benefits of past good deeds, deeds from past lives, old fare, old um, food in the sense. And the eight family said, well, that, that doesn't sound like uh, a reason to kick your daughter out of your house. And when Dan and, uh, Migara was not to be appeased, he got very, he was very, very angry. He said, fine, fine, maybe, oh, maybe if it was just that. But you know what she did in the middle of the night? She, she went with all of her students. She just left the house in the middle of the night and went outside, which, of course, is, has a... Uh, a woman in India, a married woman in India, doesn't sound like an appro appropriate behavior. You don't go wandering around in the middle of the night. Uh, and they say, "Is that true?" And she said, "Well, of course. It's it, 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 my 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 mare, my horse was giving birth, and I had to look after this. Uh, I had to look after her baby, the foal." And she explained what she had done. She had gone down to the barn, to the stable, to see her horse. And 
they looked at Migar and they said, this is the kind of thing that even ser that, that, that servants should do. And here she's doing this. This is something that you chastise and want to kick her out of your house for. And he said, well, fine. But you know, she's just not a good daughter. This, this woman is just not suitable for our household. I mean, when her father, when she was coming here, her father gave her these ten admonitions. And when you listen to them, they're just insanity. The first one, what was it? Um, the outside fire, don't bring it in. He said, if there's no fire inside, of course you have to bring fire from outside. What, what kind of advice is this? And Visaka shakes her head and says, that's not what he meant. He didn't mean about that kind of fire. He was talking about uh, gossip. When people, no, sorry, I think the first one was the in the indoor yeah the indoor fire don't don't take it out and the outdoor fire don't bring it in when um, anything that you that might that said among your family don't go and spread it among other families any any gossip that might be used against your family don't go tell it or anything you hear in the house secrets and so on and any gossip that you hear outside don't bring it into the house that's the fire outside don't bring it in. So here we have, we have the meaning. She gives the meaning of all ten of these. Give to only to one who gives. That's an interesting one. Give only to one who gives. Me, she said that this means when you give, only lend things to people if they give them back. If you know that someone never gives things back to you or never returns things, or if you lend them money and they never return it, don't don't lend it to them. Uh, don't give to one who doesn't give back. Give only to one who gives back. That's what was meant. Uh, sit, eat, and sleep happily. Yeah, lazy woman, no? Just sit around, eat, eat, eat happily. Don't. So there's no admonition to take care of your parents and so on. Just sit happily, eat happily, and sleep happily. She said, "Well, sit happily means don't sit down until you know that your parents are uh, have a place to sit and they're well tended to. Eat happily. Don't eat until your parents have eaten." Until, until everybody in the family and your husband and everyone has food, don't just eat and think of yourself. This is how you eat happily. Sleep happily means don't sleep until everyone else is ready to sleep as well. Don't just go to sleep and let everybody else do the work. Tend the fire and honor the angels. Tend the fire means tend, look after your parents and your husband because they're a fire. Look after your family because they're a fire that has to be kept, well kept or else they can become unruly. Kind of good advice for families, I think. Um, if I think many in many cases this is really it. If we look after our families, if we care for our families, and really put effort into relationships, then uh, we can avoid all of this trouble and and uh, infidelity and so on. Maybe that's naive, but I think it helps. I think it plays a part. Is that we we tend to just neglect our families and take them for granted. Anyway, it's just kind of a worldly advice. Uh, honor the angels means the same thing, to honor your parents, honor your family, and uh, take care of them. Right, so can't find any fault with with that, and the eight families like look at this guy and said, you know, you're going to kick this woman out of your house? Are you crazy? This is, you know, like <laughs> someone someone so humble and devoted and, and wise and, and just incredible, this, you know, this is who this woman... And he said, fine, fine, he said, I'm sorry, I apologize, and he said, you can stay. Do you think she's going to stay? No. <laughs> no, you know, this is the great thing about Wisaka. At this point, she says, it would not uh, It would have been totally inappropriate if I had left under, under some kind of false accusation. But now that I've been cleared, I'm leaving. <laughs> and he said, please, please, no, please don't go, don't, don't, don't. Obviously, this would be a great embarrassment now if she were to leave. And she said, I can't live here. I can't live in a house. Here I am, uh, what, one or two kilometers from from, south, from from Jetavana. I'm with the Buddha right next door. And I haven't had a single opportunity to do any good deed or go and listen to the Buddha's teaching or anything. I've never had an opportunity to... to um, to do anything Buddhist or have any, any, I'm a Buddhist. From, I haven't had any opportunity to practice Buddhism while I've been here. I can't, there's no way I can live in, a, in the house of someone who follows a different religion with no opportunity to follow my religion. 
And uh, so this Migara at this point, he caved in and said, fine, fine, you, you, can, you can look after the Buddha, you can bring the Buddha, invite the Buddha to come, whatever, just as long as you stay. And this began the... the this begin, beca began the role of Visaka as the head lay disciple of the Buddha at that point. And so he invited, she invited the Buddha to come to her house. She went to see the Buddha or sent, a, a, um, sent one of her maids to go and, and invite the Buddha. And the Buddha was invited to come one day for, for the morning meal. So they set up seats, and they set up a place for the Buddha to, to sit, but the naked ascetics heard about it, and they all came and surrounded the house. And when Migara was going to go, she, 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 she said, okay, now we're going to go, and uh, she, she, looked, she looked after the, no, she said, okay, she asked Migara to come and listen to the Buddha's teaching, or to, and serve the Buddha, and, and the ascetics say, well, how can you, how can you feed the, this, this useless monk, uh, this... Uh, Heretic, heretic, uh, uh, ascetic. No, he wears clothes. He wears robes. He doesn't go naked like us, like us arahants. And uh, so Dananjali, uh, Migara didn't go, and Visaka. So she, Visaka looked at it. Migara said, "Okay, you go ahead, and and that's okay. You you go ahead. I'll stay behind." And Visaka. So she served the Buddha and all the five hundred monks or something like that, and they all ate their meal, and then the Buddha was getting ready to give a talk, and she called, she had someone call her father, said, come, come, and have him come in and listen to the Buddha's teaching, at least. And, and, and then he heard this, and he said, yeah, I really want to go. He started getting this kind of, kind of interest in, in the Buddha, and uh, he heard, of course, heard so much, so many good things about him. And, but the naked ascetics were, no, 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 and they said, well, if you really want to listen, don't go in and don't let him see you, because uh, they're thinking if if he sees him, then he'll 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 use his magic on him, right? Because they said the Buddha had this magic. I've told this before. He had this, they said the Buddha had this kind of voodoo black magic where he could convert people to his teaching. All he had to do is talk, and somehow they just magically became Buddhist. It was really weird. <laughs> it's funny how people look at that. No, they see this happening. They think, well, that doesn't happen when we teach our student. When we teach people. When I open my mouth, people just think I'm stupid. <laughs> it's, hmm. This is why probably some ascetics just didn't open their mouths. And then people thought they were enlightened, of course. Oh, this guy doesn't talk. He must be enlightened. No, they're just afraid if they open their mouth and say something, actually, they're, they're going to make a fool out of themselves. The Buddha taught a jataka about this. this uh, there was this uh, merchant, and he had a donkey. And, uh, you know, of course, a donkey you have to feed, you have to make sure you find, you're find you able to feed him. When, you go, when he went into the city to sell his wares, often he couldn't find a place, any grass for his, his mule or his, his donkey. And uh, so he, he devised this ruse where he, he would put his donkey in someone's garden and put a wolf skin, or uh, no, a lion skin over the don over the donkey. And uh, when people saw the lion skin, they thought it was a lion, and so they wouldn't come close. They'd be too afraid, so they just thought, and they think, they, of course, they think it wasn't eating their vegetables either, because lions don't eat vegetables. And so he put this lion skin on and and uh, and went into the city. Now one day, the the uh, the, mu the people saw this, and they were kind of, uh, they were afraid of the lion, and they were kind of keeping their distance. And then the, the donkey, or the mule, or whatever it was, uh, opened its mouth and, and brayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they shot and killed it. And then the, the merchant came back and he said, oh, you died because you opened your mouth. So the Buddha taught this story in regards to these sorts of people, people who, whenever they open their mouth, something, something stupid comes out. Uh, so, for this reason, they said, hide behind this curtain, and they thought, well, the Buddha won't even know he is there and, and, and won't have anything to say to him. But, of course, we know that that's not possible. And the commentary, the, this, in the story, it gives this beautiful description of how, no matter where someone is standing when they listen to the Buddha's teaching, 
uh, everyone thinks that he's talking to them. Whether they're up in heaven, in the highest heavens, or the Brahma realms, or standing at, at uh, whether, wherever they are in, in at the, listening in from outside, they still think the Buddha's talking to them. Just like the moon, they say, when you look up at the moon, it looks, it looks the same to everyone. So, so too, when the Buddha teaches, it, it all sounds like he's addressing them. And of course, the Buddha knew that he was sitting there and, and, and did address some of the talk to him. And uh, through, the, through, the, um, through the talk, because of this, because the Buddha knew he was there and was directing the talk to him, Migara inclined his mind and, and opened his mind up and actually became a sotapanna, sitting there listening through the practice, because he would be practicing, while he was listening, he would be practicing meditation, which I assume, of course, all of you are doing as well, right? As you listen to this, you're obviously, as I can tell, engaged in contemplation of the Four Noble Truths and, and the, the three characteristics, right? What are the three characteristics? Impermanence, right? Mm -hmm. Just a second ago I wasn't, wasn't bugging you and now I'm bugging you. That's impermanent, right? Just a second ago, you had uh, you had the freedom to not meditate, and now all of a sudden you feel like you have to meditate. That suffering, you have to feel the pain of sitting there, and uh, non-self. You can't stop me from picking on you. No, really, you should. During this is a good example for us. This is how it would happen. People would just listen to the Buddhist teaching and become enlightened. Is they would actually put it into practice. It wasn't just for intellectual knowledge. Right now, as I said about, I, I said this, give this, said this curious thing about um, women in those days exposing their chests, which is kind of an odd thing to mention. But um, this is the only way I can understand this because Migara, what he did, he was so excited when he became a Sotapanna, he went up and paid respect to the Buddha and then he went to Visaka and he took her breast into his mouth <laughs> and, and uh, made an exclama exclamation, this is my mother. He took, he took Visaka as his mother. This is what uh, the story says. He uh, <laughs> went up to his daughter-in-law and, uh, well, and he took her as his mother. I mean, it was, it was a genuine uh, uh, sim gesture. And then he went up to the Buddha and said, this woman is my mother. And from that day forth, she was actually called Migara's mother. And uh, this emb embarrassed her, of course, to no, to no end, to have her father-in-law call her mother and to have everyone call her. And you see this in some of the suttas. She's not actually mentioned as Visaka. They say, one day Migara's mother and so on and so on. So it really was how she was known. And to, to, to overcome this embarrassment, the first thing she did when she had a son was name her son Migara. Mm -hmm. right. So she actually, so that people wouldn't, so she wouldn't have this embarrassment of having her father call her mother. I mean, it, it's just, it's not a bad embarrassment. It was just, she, she, she would felt kind of uh, like it was, uh, she, she wasn't worth it, or didn't deserve to have her father call her mother. But he said he called her mother because she was the one who who gave birth to him, gave birth to his 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 uh, enlightenment, or allowed him to see the truth. Then her mother-in-law. Then she invited the, the Buddha back, and her mother-in-law became a sotapanna as well. Doesn't say anything about her husband, which I think the, the heavy silence surrounding her husband inclines one to believe that her husband didn't ever become Buddhist or, or, or gain anything. It must have been a fairly... Remember how superficial he was, only interested in her beauty? But what he was good for, and I guess it kind of points to this whole attachment to beauty, is what it says next is that Visaka ended up having ten sons and ten daughters. So her husband was good for something, it seems. Something fairly uh, superficial. So the story goes, she had ten, ten sons and ten daughters, and her sons and daughters each had ten sons and ten daughters. And each of her children's children had ten sons and ten daughters. So that's twenty times twenty times twenty offspring. Four hundred times twenty? 
8,000. I think it was more than 8,000 that she actually had. 8,000. 20 times 20 times 20. No, it's not right. That's right. 20 times 20 times 20 plus, that's how many great-grandchildren she had, is 20 times 20 times 20, plus the 20 children, plus the 20 grandchildren. 8,040 offspring. And they say that Visaka never aged. She lived to be 120, but she always looked like a little girl. And so when she would walk around surrounded by her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, everyone would always have to ask, which one is Visaka? <laughs> Little things like that. Uh, okay, but let's get to the more important things. This story is dragging on. It's just it's such a long story if you actually read the story. Um, but the, the, the whole point of, of talking about all this is how, how much virtue she had, how much, how much goodness and how, what a great life she had, and, and so on and so on. It's really well, well worth the read if you can read the whole story. Um, and then she made this, there's the story of her making, the, one of the final parts of this is her, the story of her making a, a monastery. Now how this came about is one day she was walking in the monastery to, she would go and look at the sick monks and, and if, any sick, if there were any sick monks who needed it. Ah, sorry, I forgot one thing. Before we talk about this, let's, uh, no, so before we talk about this, let's talk about her, her general behavior to the Buddha. So there's, there's one very important story that is not mentioned, it's, it's mentioned but it's not recounted here because it's recounted elsewhere. But the point, the, the, the whole, the general idea that you need to get is that she would, she took care of the 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 sangha like like a mother, you know, she, so she was always caring for the monks, and so this is one example that I was just about to tell, about looking after the sick monks and making sure they had medicines and food, but that's because she had one uh, that, that's based on her uh, request to the Buddha at one point. She walked, she came up to, uh, she invited the Buddha for for a meal, and all the monks. And then the next morning, when the food was ready, she told one of her servants to go to invite the Buddha. Now, it, this happened to be a time of great rain. And in fact, it says it was raining this day. The whole, there was rain over the four continents. Now, I guess that doesn't mean the whole world, but India and, and it would have been like, uh, what, maybe um, Burma and, and Thailand and China, and then uh, Europe, and Russia, or, or whatever, I don't know, the four continents, whatever those four are. I don't think it included North America. They didn't even, they didn't even think that North America existed at that point. Or, or Anyway, it's not clear. But some very large expanse of, of the earth was covered in rain. And so it was some kind of special, special time. The Buddha somehow it seems that the Buddha was saying, like, um, this is the last time this will ever happen. Maybe the climate was changing or you know, global warming or whatever. Uh, and so he, he, he encouraged the monks. And maybe it was just the last time of the year. This was the last rain before the, um, before the hot season. And so he encouraged the monks to, to go and bathe in the rain. He just told them this is going to be the last chance. And so the monks stripped off all their robes, put them aside, and went and, and uh, bathed, in the, bathed naked in the rain. Which, of course, the Buddha hadn't said. He, he, I guess he kind of expected they would keep a robe on, but they didn't want to get their robes wet. So they all went and bathed naked in the rain. And then this female servant of Visaka comes, and, and she's get, looking around to invite the monks, and all she sees is a bunch of naked ascetics. So she goes back to Visaka and says, Mistress, there are no monks in the monastery. It's full of a bunch of naked ascetics. And Wisaka says, naked ascetics? Oh, and she said, oh, they must be bathing in the rain. And she said, oh, how embarrassing. She said, okay, go, now go back. The rain stopped. And she said, oh, now go back and in, invite them again. Tell them that the, the food is ready. So she goes back, and all the monks by that time had put, it, had put their robes back on gone, and gone into their kutis and sat down and, and started meditating. And so she goes back and she looks around the monastery and where did they all go? There's nobody here now. She goes back to, 
Visakha and says, Mistress, there's no one in the monastery now. They've all gone, they've all disappeared. And uh, not a very bright girl, I think. And Visakha, of course, understood that they must be all meditating. She said, okay, now go again. And one, one final time, go and, and you'll see, you can ask them. And so she goes another time. And I, I, something like as she's on her way, or, or just before she's going to leave, the Buddha appears. Because um, there were flood, there was flooding everywhere, and so the Buddha told the monks to prepare your bowls, get ready, and he gathered them all up, and he just opened up a wormhole and, and appeared at at her front door, and went in. Uh, anyway, there's a point to this. The point is when when she, when when they sat sat the Buddha down and all the monks down, Visaka kind of didn't know how to approach it, but kind of said. Okay, um, Bhante, Venerable Sir, um, could I ask you eight for eight boons or eight favors, eight blessings? Eight, uh, I have eight boons, the, the word is boon, you know, uh, that I would like to ask. And the Buddha said, I'm not a king, you know, or he said, the Buddha, what he really said is, Buddhas are not, not uh, ones to give boons. Like he's not a he's not a some kind of king or something. He's kind of a king, but not in this sense. Not the sort of person who give who grants wishes or grants boons. And Visaka said they're blameless but but Venerable Sir, these these wishes are blameless. And he said, Okay, well what are they? And so she asked eight things. She said, First, please allow me to provide bathing cloths for the monks. Rains cloths went for when it rains, like a special cloth for when, uh, when it's raining so they can bathe in. Number two, for monks who are coming, who have new, newly come to the monastery, may I be allowed to give them um, a special meal? May they have, know that, may, they, may, I, may I be able to broadcast it that monks who have just come are always allowed to, are always able to come and have a meal at my, at my home. Monks who are leaving on a trip May they may may I have the blessing of being able to serve them. Monks who are sick, may I be able to provide food for sick monks. Uh, monks who are looking after sick monks, may I be able to be able to provide for them. Uh, and f medicine for sick monks, may I be able to provide medicine for any monk that gets sick. And that's uh, six. Number seven. May I be able to, oh shoot, I forgot number seven. I don't think I wrote them down either. Am I the monster? No, let's lay down. And, mm, memory, no? Shelter. Ah, yes, to have... Um, a constant supply uh, to be able to provide always um, rice gruel, porridge for all the monks. So my, may my house always be a place, may I be able to uh, provide the monks, please allow me to invite the monks to always uh, receive gruel or, or porridge at my house. Of course she couldn't say all the monks come and eat at her house because there was many, many monks and many people, of course, who wanted to provide food and wanted to support. There were many Buddhists in Savati. And the Buddha asked, you know, why, what is the reason, f why do you think these are important? Why do, you, why do you request these eight things? And she explained, she said, no, well, first of all, I saw the monks naked, you know, I heard that the monks were naked and my servant went and she said, Venerable Sir, nudity is kind of embarrassing and so on. And she said, so if they had a rain's bathing cloth, then they wouldn't have to do that. Uh, food for monks who are just coming, monks who are, who, are, who are coming from far away, maybe it was hard for them to get food. And when they come, they of course don't know where to go for alms. They don't have any family supporting them or so on, so they won't have, it will be very difficult for them to gain alms. So if they've just come, it wouldn't be a great thing to be able to offer them food. Monks who are going on a journey, when they go on a journey, it'll be hard for them to get food, so they should get food first and then head out when they're heading out early in the morning. Um, food for sick monks, of course, if they don't get the right food, they'll, they might die. Monks who are looking after sick monks, and it's difficult for them to get food uh, when they have to also get food for the sick monks. 
uh, medicine for sick monks, of course, if they don't get the medicine, they'll die. Uh, rice gruel, because of the because of how great rice gruel is, was her, her her idea. The Buddha had given ten reasons why in the morning you should have some kind of rice gruel or porridge. And uh, oh, I mentioned I missed the eighth one, right? I didn't mention it. The eighth one. Um, is to provide to provide bathing cloth for the bhikkhunis because the bhikkhunis were not allowed to bathe naked either, uh, and they actually had to have a cloth that covered their their chest as well. And uh, she said because of because it had, because of the rule because they had embarrassed themselves and down in the river once bathing naked. And then the Buddha said, so and and what do you hope to gain from asking for these eight wishes. And Visaka says, an interesting reply, she said, well, um, I think that monks come from all over the, all over the country asking to ask the Buddha, oh, this, this monk died, and what did he attain? Before he died, did he become, what, what sort of attainment did he gain? And the Buddha would say, uh, this, this monk became a Sotapanna, this monk became a Sakidagami, and so on. And she said, uh, when I when when these monk, when monks come to me for for rice gruel or for meals or, or for when 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 uh, when they come to visit me or when I talk to these monks, I'll ask them, uh, what did the Buddha say? And the Buddha, and they'll tell me, and, and then she'll say, well, did this monk did that monk ever come for did that monk ever come from Sabati come to Sabati? And if the answer is yes, if she hears that this monk ever came from to Sabati, she'll know that that enlightened being must have gotten rain's bathing cloth, must have gotten food for the sake, you know, all these things must have somehow benefited, she must have somehow helped this monk. And so she said, that will be of great benefit to me, that will support my own practice and make me feel, feel good inside. You know, this goodness, the power of goodness. So, this is, so the Buddha allowed her to have these eight blessings. And this is really um, sort of a... Um, This is an, an example, uh, or sort of uh, indicative of, of the sort of life that she lived as, as a support for the Buddha's teachings. She was constantly supporting the Buddha and his monk and the, his uh, sangha. And it came to a consummation, and with the story that I was just going to tell. So she, she, these, these eight these eight blessings. This is this was. A, how she then lived most of her life, constantly supporting the Buddha and his followers and, and, and making sure that the Buddha was able to, to spread his teaching. Uh, until one day, she went to the monastery, as I said, and was walking around looking at sick monks. But she, 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 when she went out, she had to wear this, remember this, this, this headdress that we talked about and that went down to her feet and was just, it was, it was very, very heavy to wear. And uh, so she would take it off. She said, it's not, not proper for me to go and you know, wear this into the monastery. So she gave it to her servant and said, put this aside somewhere and, and let's go walking through the monastery. So put it aside somewhere in, in some building in the monastery and, and then went walking throughout the monastery looking at the sick monks. And then when she was leaving the monastery, she left by another, a different gate than she had entered. And she said to her, servant, her attendant, where is, please bring my headdress. And the servant said, oh, I forgot it. It's at that, it's, it's in one of the monk kutis, or one of the, one of the buildings. And she said, okay, fine, go get it. But if uh, the monk, one of the monks picked it up, if, if, if one of the monks touched it, you don't, don't take it back. If someone picked it up, I don't want any idea that, um, any any sort of hard feeling. If it if they touched it, uh, you leave it leave it for the the monks. I won't take it back. Uh, and uh, so she went back, and sure enough, Ananda had picked it up and said, "Oh, this must belong to Wisaka. This we we can't let this uh, just sit around." And so he put it aside for her and said, "Okay, well let's put this aside, and she'll come back for it." And the servant came back and asked Ananda, "Did you see this?" And she said, "Oh yes, I put it aside." And here, you can take it. And she said, oh, no, no, I can't take it. My, my, my mistress said that if, if, anyone had if any monk had touched it, she would not take anything back that had been touched by the monks. And so she went back and told her mistress, and her mistress said, oh, very, very good. Oh, no, I don't have to, I guess now I don't have to take that 
heavy, heavy piece of jewelry around with me or something. That's what I would have said anyway. I mean, like, good, good, good riddance. Give it to the monks, no? That's just what they need. Is no, but the point, the point was, <laughs> was that they could do something. They could put it to some, sell it or something. But then she said, no, no, this is, but this isn't appropriate. We can't leave this precious thing with the monks. That'll just cause suffering for them because, of course, the monks aren't allowed to do anything except keep it aside. If some something valuable, monks aren't supposed to even touch valuable, like precious gems or gold or, or silver even. Not even allowed to touch it except to put it aside for someone who, who, who it belongs to, if, if it's in the monastery. And she said, go and take it back and we'll sell it. And we'll, give the, we'll, get, we'll donate the money to this Sangha. Or we'll do something with the money to, for, for the purpose of the Sangha. And so she went and the servant went and brought, brought it back. And so they put it on sale, put it on Craigslist or something like that. And uh, surprise, surprise, no one had the money to buy it. And we say it cost, it cost nine koti, ninety million pieces of gold, and so asked around. Nobody was, nobody could buy it. Misaka said, "Fine, I'll buy it." So, she, so she bought her own headdress back. This is the kind of thing that, that, um, well, I guess you'd say religious zealots do. But, but it's kind of in a good way, you know, it's kind of people who are so caught up in goodness. If you read some of the Jataka stories, there's a lot of stories like this of where they would compete, and there was a competition that went on between the king and his, his, um, his subjects. The king would do some, some great, great uh, act of merit, and then the, the subjects would, would, would outdo him. And then the king would see them doing that, and then the king out, would outdo them, and then back and forth and back and forth until f finally someone would give in, this kind of thing. So just kind of extreme acts of goodness. So she bought back her own headdress and took the money and donated it to the monastery. So she took these cartloads of gold to the monastery and said, Venerable Sir, this is the Buddha, <clears throat> um, I have this uh, money and we'd like to do something. What do you think we should do? What, what would you allow me to do for the, the Sangha? And she says to, she says, uh, the Buddha says to him, well, would you like to build a monastery for the monks? Some, some building for the monks to dwell to, some residence for the monks? And she says yes. And so this is how the, the Visakha came to make Bubarama, I believe. Pubarama. Pubarama means what they came to first. It's where the monks would come to before they reached Jetavana or something like that. Or maybe it was part of Jetavana, I'm not sure. And um, the Buddha put Moggallana in charge of helping to build it, but it's not really important. Anyway, so she built this monastery. And once it was finished, she filled it up with all these, well, with all sorts of furnishings, rugs everywhere and and. and Beds for the monk, bedding for the monks, it just totally decked out. And one of her, to the point where they say, one of her friends came along and had uh, a rug, a very expensive rug, carpet of some sort, and went to Isaka and said, No, look, can I donate this carpet? I want to take part in your merit, in, in this, this act of goodness. Can I take part in it? And she said, If I tell you no, you're going to think I want to, I'm hogging the merit for myself. So she said, go throughout the monastery and if you find one place where there isn't a carpet you're welcome to put it there and so she went through the whole of this monastery this monastery took another nine or took of course nine no how did it go she bought the land for the monastery for nine koti for the amount of money that she had got for she had spent on this headdress she spent another nine koti 90 million pieces of gold building the monastery and furnishing it. And she spent another nine, 90 million uh, taking, looking after the monks, giving alms around food. She gave alms repeatedly for 40 days or something like that. So anyway, it was a, it was a big expense. So we're talking about a huge complex, I guess. And she went around, and of course this woman could find nowhere, and she was so dejected, she went, she went, and, she, she went and sat down somewhere and started crying because she couldn't find any place. And Ananda, of course Ananda is the wonderful, the wonderful guy that he was, he uh, 
why are you crying? And I can't find that. And so Ananda found her a place to use the carpet as a, a, a foot wiping mat for the monks. And he said, go and when the, there's a place where the monks, when they come back from alms, they have to step up, put it there. And then the monks, every monk will wipe his feet on your expensive carpet, actually. But actually will gain great merit. So she was very happy about that. And so for 40 days, Visaka gave alms, and then at the end, where this verse comes in, she started, uh, she started reciting these verses, and they were verses of, of uh, aspiration. When will I be able to give, when will I, when will I be able to give, uh, what is it? When will I be able to give a monastery? When will I have the opportunity to give a monastery? And she said, that wish is now fulfilled. When will I have the chance to give lodging and bedding? That wish is now fulfilled. These were, uh, when will I have the opportunity to give food? When will I have the opportunity to give uh, robes? When will I have the opportunity to give medication, medicine? This wish is now fulfilled. There's some kind of Pali verse that she was singing, and the monks said, they were sitting around and, and they said, hmm, you know, never heard her sing before, this is kind of weird, and they said, I wonder if she's gone crazy. And the Buddha came up and asked, what are you guys talking about? And they said, well, we're talking about Visaka, and she's just started wandering, because she, she, she was actually wandering around the monastery, kind of smiling, and reciting these verses, in bliss, actually. And they asked the Buddha. They said, and the Buddha, they said, you know, is she, is she maybe gone crazy? She's, she's just started singing because singing is actually considered to be a form of insanity in, in the Buddhist teaching. And uh, the the Buddha said, she's not singing. She's she's remembering, and reciting back the vows that she made. And the Buddha told a story of the past of how. She had made these vows a uh, hundred thousand, one one hundred thousand eons ago, in the time of Padumutra Buddha. She made a, a determination. What she had done is she, one of her friends was she was friends with the woman who was the chief female lay disciple of the Buddha, and she saw how she was so close to the Buddha and would, would have have these conversations with the Buddha and. and of such a familiarity with the Buddha that uh, she went to the Buddha one day and she went up to the Buddha and asked him, who is this woman to you? And, and Oh, she is the one who looks after the Sangha. And she said, how does one become such a person? And he said, by making a resolve for 100,000 eons. And so she made that resolve. She invited the Buddha to take alms at her house for seven days. And for seven days, she after at the end of seven days, she said, all the merit that I have gained from this, I don't want anything from it except may I one day be the chief female lay disciple for a fully enlightened Buddha. And Padumuttara Buddha looked into the future and saw that one day she would become the chief lay disciple, female lay disciple of Gautama Buddha. And then the Buddha said, just as Visaka has done such wonderful things, he said, this is, a, this is an example for all human beings. Uh, and then he, he gave this verse, just just like, just when just as when you're given a big heap of flowers, you can make so many beautiful things out of it. So too, one who is given this life as a human being, or is born to this life as a human being, should take the opportunity and take what they have been, what they have acquired, and make beautiful deeds or cultivate wholesomeness. Uh, out of what the, out of out of it, out of the potential of the human the human life. So there's the verse, and I haven't even gotten into explaining. There's the story, and I haven't even gotten into explaining the verse. Uh, I think the story hopefully does some some of the work for me. But the gist of it is that um, we, we're we're thrown into this life without any sort of direction. We don't have any user's manual. It doesn't come with a driver's manual or user guide. And so we're often at a loss for how to live our lives and, and where to, to direct our energies and direct our focus. 
to fo where to focus our, our, our energies on. And as a result, we, we, cultivate, we cultivate a whole a wide range of, of behaviors and end up uh, an aggregate of lots of different good and bad, skillful and unskillful habits. And we wind up um, somehow a hodgepodge, a mess of habits and behaviors. So this is, this is a central concept to Buddhism, to, to seize the potential that you have and to make use of what, of what you have and to, to do something with it. So the, the, the idea here that's kind of, uh, kind of interesting and I think is, is, is quite important to, to conceive is that it answers this question of purpose. And the Buddha is not saying here that you must do this or you must do that. He's saying, whatever you're given, make something beautiful out of it, right? And so we're given so much, and, and not only that, but, but pointing out how much good and how much potential we're given as human beings, that there are many flowers that we can, many good things that we can pull out of life, and that we, this is a duty of, of or this is, a, this is something that is, is um, very m much a part of our uh, our duty or our, what we should be doing in making out of life is to do good deeds. We shouldn't just let these flowers go to waste or let, let the goodness or the potential. We have so much potential to do good deeds like this. I mean, you walk by uh, a beggar on the side of the road, that's, this is a potential to do something good and if you waste that potential. The Buddha said, if people knew, as I know, the good of giving, what good comes from charity and generosity and, and, and just goodness? No one would eat. No one would eat a, eat a meal without sharing it with whoever there was around to eat, without, uh, sharing it with someone who was worthy of sharing that meal. He said, but it's because people don't know that they don't do these things. He said, it wouldn't, a meal wouldn't go by. You wouldn't put anything aside without sharing it with, with someone else. And so we, we, the charity is often something that we overlook in our Buddhist practice, at least in the West, because we jump right into meditation. We, 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 we miss these two other aspects of goodness, which is morality and charity. Charity or goodness or support or help and all these things that Visaka gave, not just materials, but the support for the Sangha, looking after sick monks and caring for not directly, but making sure they got their medicines and, and care that they needed and looking after uh, Buddha's teaching and looking after her family and, and bringing Buddhism to her, bringing goodness, enlightenment even to her family. Um, All of this is a, all. This is a very, very important part of, or it it brings a great support for our practice. These are things that we often overlook in our practice, and and as a result, when we focus only on meditation, our minds are often um, as a, again they're all, they're a mess of of all of our activities. If we engage in 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 stinginess, if we're attached very much to our possessions and never sharing, never giving, never helping others, uh, it, it can, it's very difficult for us to settle our minds because we don't have any anything to feel good about, we don't have anything to feel encouraged. I mean, the practice of meditation is for the purification of the mind, for making you a good person. And we're always talking about the defilements in the mind and the, the, the selfishness, the, the, the bad things inside. And so it can be quite disheartening to realize that you're full of bad things. But this is often how we come to be when we haven't lived our lives, like the Buddha said, um, making bouquets out of the flowers instead of trampling on them and uh, turning our life into a rotten mess of filth. Uh, morality. So morality and charity are two very important aspects of Buddhist practice of goodness and they are two things that support our meditation practice greatly. 
But it, it doesn't necessarily have to be just charity and morality. Meditation, of course, is the greatest goodness of all. But all three of these, and, and, and many others as well, any sort of goodness, whatever sort of goodness there is, all of this should be cultivated. This is what we're trying to do with this monastery, with this meditation center. You can see it's not just about meditation, though that is very, very much the focus. There also is a sense of supporting other people and, and helping each other and, and providing um, support for the practice of, of goodness and the cultivation of goodness. And also giving Dhamma talks is for the purpose of encouraging goodness and uh, encouraging morality or encouraging a lifestyle or a way of life that is wholesome and, and skillful and beneficial to self and other, to the whole world. So, at the very least, this should be an encouragement for us, a reminder for us of the importance of doing good deeds, the importance of focusing our lives on what is really important. Matjena, the word jatena matjena is really an important aspect. This matcha, matcha is often translated just as human, but it really means mortal. Matcha has, it comes from, from the same root. We have this mar. In French, we have more, which means dead, right? So, so uh, and in mortal, right? More um, comes from mar, which mar, which means death or, or to to die. Uh, matcha is just the past. Someone who has or matcha no matcha means not past tense. It's someone who is subject to one who has death means mortal, someone who is mortal. And so the point being, you know, we, our, our lives are finite. Like if you remember that funny story that I told some of you about, uh, uh, what was it? What was her name? Uh, Pati Pujika, this woman who worshipped her husband. But it wasn't her husband. She was thinking of her husband up in heaven. And so when she got up to heaven, her husband says, oh, Wow, human beings live so short of a lifespan. Do they, they? They must be so intent on doing good deeds. Because she, in the morning, she died, and in the afternoon, she came back. And where were you all morning? Oh, I died and was born a human. Oh, how long were, were you a human? Sixty, sixty-five years, or sixty-six years, seventy years, or something like that. And he said, "Wow, that's only a few hours up here." I said, "Wow, they live such a short, such short lives. They must be so intent on doing good deeds." And she said, "Not really." <laughs> No, no, they, they see, they act as though they live, they're, they're going to live forever. They seem to act as though they're going to live millions and millions of years. And death catches them by surprise. So there's this kind of, I, this, this, this general idea in Buddhism that life is short. And that doesn't mean you should just seize the day and, and in the sense of living a hedonistic lifestyle of, of in, in, indulging and gorging yourself. Because we see what that does. Uh, well, we don't quite see what it does, but we see part of what it does. We see how that messes it up for our children. What we don't see is how we become our children's children. Right? We, we, are, uh, we become the next generation. We're messing it up actually for ourselves. We have to come back and deal with the mess. So all of this hedonism is really um, screwing ourselves over we are setting ourselves up for a great amount of, of difficulty in the future. It's something to think about from a Buddhist perspective that, you know, you think, ah, whatever, you know, I'm only going to live for a hundred years, so it doesn't matter, I'll just enjoy myself, right? And then, you know, when you come back in your next life, and you know, oh, why is the world getting so hot and, and polluted and, and so much war and crime and suffering and so on? It's like, you did this, you did this to yourself. We do it to ourselves. So there's something very important there, and much more important in terms of our spiritual practice and becoming free from this. We make our universe. We make our lives. So we would be wise to focus ourselves, focus our attention, just as the Buddha said, on making bouquets out of flowers, taking the good stuff that we have in life and doing something good with it, making something of our lives. Just as a... Just as a you would just as you would make bouquets out of flowers or garlands out of flowers, I think it says. So that's the story. And thank you for tuning in, and hope it's been somehow encouraging, encouraging, and and an inspiration to make something of your life and to do good deeds, 
uh, and to make the world a better place for you and, and for everyone else. I hope that through your practice and through whatever goodness or whatever inspiration you have gained from this, that everyone is able to uh, cultivate and put into practice the Buddha's teaching for the furtherance of their own enlightenment and the attainment of peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering for all. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good day.